Oke, okay. um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, welcome to International Law uh, of the Sea class. Uh, this is a very special uh, uh, meeting because uh, in this uh, in this meeting we have a sharing session, um, and we we see here there there are also others. Uh, participants who are not the students of uh, uh, the, uh, the students of the international law of the sea class uh, welcome um the seren session is, is, is an event uh, 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 held by the international uh, international law department uh, which uh, we invite the alumni of uh, uh, of the faculty of law and part of course to share their knowledge and also their experience and um, regarding the uh, uh, um, the topics related to the course. And today we have uh, Kang Adit. <laughs> uh, uh, we have uh, Nan, uh, Kang Nan, uh, Nanditya Wardana. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum, Kang Adit. Waalaikumsalam. Good morning, Bu Orin. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, serious sekali. And for, for those who are questioning uh, this class yes most of the class in international law classes are held in, in English are conducted in English but it's uh, uh, it's flexible so don't worry if uh, maybe be, uh, sometimes we talk French sometimes we talk Germany <laughs> so please just enjoy the class and uh, uh, today we are going to take the uh, topics on the safety on uh, the implementations of the UNCLOS 1982 on the implement uh, on the safety of navigations and the marine environment protection and uh, before we start i'd like to introduce uh, who is kang adit uh, oh yeah oh, sorry okay i have to introduce myself thank you Rere, for reminding me i am the lecturer uh, one of the teaching uh, team for the international law of the sea i'm not an expert that's why i call kang adit to share uh, his ex uh, his expertise here <laughs> um i'm uh, I I'm, I have my bachelor degree in international law in, in, in UNPAD and my master in Nottingham University in the UK. Okay, I think we have to change the slide, please. <laughs> it's not necessary to introduce me. So we'll introduce the uh, Kang Adit. Uh, please, can you please uh, share the uh, information on Kang Adit? Okay. Uh, Kang Adit had, uh, had his uh, Bachelor of Law from the Faculty of Law Universitas Pajajaran, majoring international law. She he took the class in 2000, uh, he's my classmate, and he continued to uh, his master program as a magis, um, management, Magister of Management, also in UNPAD, but then he found uh, finally his patient, or maybe enforced <laughs> by his duty, he continued his, <laughs> his master. Uh, he had his Master of Science for the Maritime Law and Policy. Uh, he got the scholarship from the Sakawa Fellowship of the Nippon Foundation. Uh, uh, it's at a World Maritime University. Oh, hang on. Sorry. We have advertisement. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Kang Adit and audience. It's okay. always happened uh, <laughs> because it's working from home. And uh, uh, currently, Kang uh, Ka Adit uh, work, work as an officer for the International Cooperation Directorate of Nav Navigations. Oh. And, and uh, uh, he's the as uh, you can see from the, uh, from the CV, he's the Assistant Deputy Director. Mm. And then I think now he's the Assistant Dep uh, uh, Deputy Director for the Operations for the Sub-Directorate of the Maritime Communications, Directorate of Navigations, uh, Three, uh, sea Transportation, Kementerian Perhubungan, uh, Direktorat Laut. Uh, is that correct, Kang Adit? Yeah. Maybe we, we, at first we would uh, be wondering why, what is the relations of the Ministry of Transportation because usually people, uh, students always think that, oh, okay, if you talk yep. international law and then our people is only for Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but it's not. See, we have Ministry of Transportation, who's not only dealing with Damri or PJKA or <laughs> but uh, Kang Adit is a specialist for the safety of navigation and marine protection. And he is uh, the representations and all led the delegations for many uh, uh, conferences, <laughs> maritime organization, international maritime satellite organization, and many more. So he is one of the important persons in Indonesia no. who can share <laughs> a lot of things, specialties about the safety of navigation. Gitu ya, Kang Adit. <laughs> 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 Kang Adit, um, 
before you start your before you start um, uh, sharing Uh, can you hear me? What? Telvin. Kang Adit punten ditunggu sebentar. Oh, siap. Oke. Okay. Halo, sorry. Okay. Connected. I don't know something wrong. Uh, Oke. Okay. I'm sorry. Oke. Okay. So, uh, did I already introduce? Uh, did you catch my introduction? You're freezing. Thank you. Okay, hello. Okay, hello. Can you hear my voice? Yep. Yeah, okay. Is it clear? Yeah, it's clear. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. Suddenly, there's a problem in connections. Um, did I already introduce, uh, did the audience get my introductions about Kang Adit? I think all of them already hear your <laughs> brief introduction. <laughs> <laughs> okay then okay then we will uh i think it's a kind of a, a bit uh a bad connection here but is it okay is my voice can be heard clearly now is it audible yes it's so clear okay okay then okay thank you sigar i i apologize for all the audience for for these technical issues uh kangeri i see kangeri welcome uh to this class uh Kangeri is also the lecturer, but his specialty is in the air, uh, air, air and space law. So there's a, there's a relation with the transportation also, but <laughs> today we're going to talk about the, the sea, uh, but his expertise is, uh, on the, is in, in the air. <laughs> okay, uh, Kadit, before you start uh, uh, sharing your expertise, um, or maybe I would like to address some issues related to what happened, particularly in Indonesia, because we're going to talk about the implementations of the UNCLOS on the safety of navigations, as well as marine environment within the Indonesia, particularly in Indonesia. Um, I think we already know that there are a lot of, uh, there are some problems. I don't know if is it a lot or not, maybe you can explain it later, about the situations of the safety of navigations. We heard many accidents on the sea the the main uh, the common issues is about the overload of the passengers right and uh, um, and also um, uh, we know we heard that some cases are in in the city of the Sulawesi and also I think we, uh, we all we most of us also know about the Danau Toba uh, uh, incidents and uh, um, those uh, are happened in Indonesia because the overload, particularly in the peak seasons of kind of Lebaran of the Mudik time, yeah. And uh, I've experienced taking a boat from the uh, um, southeast Sulawesi to the island of Mona because that's the hometown of my husband. And I just knew that the, actually, the uh, if we take a boat or if we take the ship, it's not only Pelni. There are a lot of the private companies also having this business. So maybe you can also share. Uh, how is actually uh, the, the regulations to, to them? Because uh, if we took the VIP, VIP class, it was okay. It was comfortable. But with the economy class, that I think I think that's the, that's the cost of the overload uh, of passengers. And also I would like to ask whether is there any regulations about, if we know we, if a pilot, 
uh, also a driver. They have, they must have a license to drive or to take the to take the plane. It, is it also the same for the for the navigation? Uh, but uh, is it only for the uh, uh, for the ship who take passengers, or is it also shall be applied to like a traditional fisherman? Because I because you're not quite sure. Maybe you can also explain about that. Because many traditional fishermen they do uh, fishing and take the boat traditionally. They have they have the skill because of the parents. And back to the safety of the navy. So uh, I mean, this is also maybe can be. Is it also one of the cause that the I heard uh, I, I read some case uh, that the uh, accidents that the accident in the sea is also caused by the unskill or la lack of knowledge on the uh, safety uh, of navigations by the um, um, what we call it the the captain of the boat. And is it also because of that? And uh, and when the accident happened, we know uh, let's say the collisions or. Of course, it gives uh, effect like a, um, uh, the, uh, like a debris for the for the sea. And if it, if the ship wrecked, maybe it's also a da uh, uh, um, dangerous make make a dangerous for the for the uh, 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 organism beyond uh, beyond the sea uh, below the sea. Sorry, and. Uh, and uh, uh, not not to mention the oil spill. We have, I think, quite popular case, the oil spill in Karawang, if I'm not mistaken, from the Pertamina. Maybe you can also share about that. And I think the last case, we uh, um, the submarine, If uh, I think we all, we all, all of us know uh, about the um, uh, submarine um, Nangala. 402, but not particular in that. But my question is, is that also the, the safety of navigations also apply to the submarine and also the marine environment uh, protection uh, in regards to the, uh, to the effect of the uh, 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 accidents or, uh, by uh, uh, this sub submarine also reg regulated? Because what I know, if the accident uh, by ship, okay, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, I think Maybe it's. I think it's regulated, and it's. Uh, and also, uh, what we heard about, like uh, Sriwijaya Air. I think all of us know about that. Um, it uh, uh, the accident, then uh, the plane crashed into the sea. But there are a lot of. Uh, of this sort of explosions, explosions. Of course, I think it can also uh, give effect to the environment uh, below uh, below the sea. Uh, and what I know that the Ministry of uh, Environment already had uh, kind of regulations to uh, very detailed, even to calculate economic loss for for the, the environment damage but uh, so those are the thing probably the the issues regarding to the safety of navigations and also marine environment that we uh, public know so can i did as the as a specialist for uh, of this from the ministry of <laughs> transportation maybe you can give some more enlightenment for us what is actually uh, how the regulations is and uh, we, uh, as we uh, we know that i am i am a regulation is one have so many um uh, what we call it, implementing legislations, like uh, hundreds probably, uh, so many regulations, it's quite con uh, confusing. It's, does Indonesia also apply to, uh, 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 by, uh, sorry, bound by all of those treaties and how is it implemented to Indonesian laws and what are the challenges? This, uh, what we know that uh, so many regulations, uh, so many legal instruments that quite good. But the problem is actually when we do research in many in many issues, so the, the problem is in the implementations. Uh, uh, well, there's the difficulties in the field. So maybe you can also call it, uh, 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 elaborate about it. And what else? Yeah, I think there are a lot of issues. Sorry, Kang, I did. So maybe you can all just uh, 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 your your explanation maybe probably will respond to to the matters. Uh, okay, uh, Kang, I did. The floor is yours. Oh, wow, it's just the beginning. You already gave me so many questions. <laughs> I haven't given you any explanation. You already gave me so many questions. So yes. It's okay. But uh, before I explained uh, several items that related with your questions, I actually I already uh, inserted all of those uh, explanations on my presentations. But however, I would like to uh, explain it First, on the, your first question, related with the overload and over dimensions of ships. Uh, 
that's it's it is one of the problem right now because uh, I will I will give the answer right now then I will uh, I don't know I will explain it further on my presentation but I will give you a hint what I will give <laughs> during the presentations so the first thing about the profit load and over dimensions uh, the, the difficulties is in Indonesia we have two different regime related to the ships the one that being regulated by the uh, Director General of Sea Transportations, and those the one that being regulated by the uh, land transportations and also the fisheries. So, so this is the, one of the difficulties. If you are looking at the Danau accidents, it's actually they, they are the one that being regulated by the land transportations, including the ferry. The one that you mentioned earlier is actually been the, regulated by the land transportation because they consider as a bridge from one island to another island then they've been regulated by the, 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 the land transportations so uh the regulation that being developed by the land transportation agency is not too stringent if we compare it with the uh the one that being regulated by the other general of city transportations so the, the different standards makes those things happen so that's why we already give them uh, some kind of a more uh, knowledge about the standardization of the sea ships and they trying to develop that and they trying to regulate it in, on their own regulations uh, that's the hint so uh, yes overload and over dimension is a problem especially during those long holiday during lebaran probably but we are trying to fix that it's still under the Ministry of Transportation, but we are trying to uh, make any improvement related to it. And yes, there are so many private company, uh, not only Pelni, but in uh, in Indonesia, there's so many uh, what is it? Uh, company that dealing with those kind of uh, transportations. But the standards is the same. If you're talking about the Pelni or the passenger ships, we are the one who do the regulations or something like that. So yes, uh, I will give you further inspiration letters. And yes, the pilot, the master, they have their license under the STCW conventions. And the chefs for uh, vessels, for fisheries, also engage with those uh, license as well, uh, because there are STCWF for fisheries. So they have their own uh, uh, license for it. And probably, can I move to my presentation, Teori? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, what <laughs> I was expected that you will answer all of the, my <laughs> questions on your presentation, so okay. it will be wide explanation. <laughs> okay, okay. But thank you, thank you for the highlighting uh, all of the questions in short. Uh, so, okay, students, uh, we will hear a uh, uh, long explanations of <laughs> all of those questions. Uh, please, Kang, uh, Kang Adit, and uh, uh, can he share the screen? Um, can, yeah. yes. Is he alone? Oh, okay. Can thank you, you see it? Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Bu Orim, uh, Bu Corin, uh, for the invitations and Pak Gary. Uh, good morning. And uh, yeah. this. Better to meet you. But uh, I'm sorry, Kang. Uh, maybe it's better to make the presentation in a full screen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry for that. Okay. Sorry, Kang. Can you see it? Okay. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Welcome. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to thank the faculty for inviting me and especially to the uh, to Teh Orin uh, on this sharing session. I would like to give you several main information on the safety of navigations and marine environmental protection issues and which relevant to the UNCLOS 1982. And uh, we would like to share several issues, hot issues right now. It's, including those submarine issues and then the uh, marine environmental protection issues, the PSSA, in case you have heard it, and then how the relevancy of the ship registry with the uh, safety of navigation and marine environmental protections. So on my first slide, I would like to give you a bit uh, information about the maritime transport facts. I know that we as a legal scholars uh, we kind of uh, allergic with the numbers, but you need to know that the numbers is very important to us in reality. 
because based on this number, we can develop the, uh, the, 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 the policy, the right policy, the right uh, regulations that suits to one particular issues. Uh, in this number, the, this figures, I would like to give you explanations about the importance of the uh, maritime transport itself. Uh, the first things about the vessels, the numbers of vessels, uh, Indonesia is actually number uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the largest uh, uh, flag of registrations. Uh, and then uh, the seafarers in Indonesia, in total, there are 1.2 million uh, seafarers uh, works uh, all over the world. And then uh, the seaborne trade's volume is like 11 billion tons. It's like 90% of the world transport right now using the maritime transport. And the world commercial fleet right now increased 2.0 billion DWT. DWT and then the, we, the global container for traffic it reached uh, 793 million TUs. Uh, if guess you don't know what is TUs, uh, you know that one container is considered one TU. So if you are uh, if you want to know right now, if the whole world, there are 7 million TUs uh, in, in, in coming or departing from one port. And then 61% of all goods is actually unloaded in SNC ports. And then the following economy uh, share of seaborne trade import grows to 64%. And the world commercial fleet grew by 52 million and half the world fleet is owned by Asian companies. And uh, the throughput container is reached uh, increased 4.7%. And this is the important one, the, 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 the vessel size. From the two, 20 years ago, right now, the ships built in the last four years is nine times bigger, the tankers, the container ships is four times bigger, and the general cargo ships three times bigger and the bulk is twice as big. It means that the ships may carry those containers that could more efficient, but there are several risks that may occur. The first one, the, the, the safety of navigation issues should be uh, very uh, high because the ship is getting bigger and the others will be the container. Uh, the ports should be ready to receive the biggest ships that may come to their uh, port. And then the annual carbon dioxide emission by vessel types. Uh, if you can see that, because there's so many ships that are bigger uh, from the 20 years ago, compared to 20 years ago, the annual carbon dioxide is increasing. So the, the, the number of ships is getting uh, bigger. The number is, 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 is there, I mean, uh, there, there are 219.22,499 tons of CO2 and something like that. So uh, these figures make us need to know what steps that we really need to do, what convention that we need to argue for, what kind of regulation we need to develop, the technical aspects. And then, uh, sorry. Uh, before... I continue to the issues of relatives with the safety of navigation and marine environmental protections. I would like to refresh your memories about the UNCLOS itself. Of course, and of course, you already know this facts that it's entered into force in November 94, has been ratified by 168 states, uh, covered the most important main issues, and it, it's considered as constitution of Dutch oceans. And it channels three types of merchant states, the coastal states, port states, and flag states. And the historical precedent, you already may be aware about the High Codification Conference, the first Law of the Sea Conference, the second <laughs> Law of the Sea Conference, and others. Uh, the main convention features, uh, of course, the first one, it solves the questions of the bread of the territorial sea. And then uh, it succeeded the establishing a compulsory procedure of dispute settlement and created two, three new institutions, which is the International Seabed Authority, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the Commission for the Limits of the Continental Self, and the International Recognitions. This is the most important one the International Recognition of the Attribute States Concepts. 
uh, why I mentioned about the maritime zones, because when we would like to regulate about the safety of navigation and marine environmental protection, we need to know our rights when, and we need to know our obligations. That's why, because of these maritime zones, for instance, what we can do in archipelagic waters, what we can do in the territorial seas, and what we can do in the contiguous zone until the economic exclusive zone. That's why I reiterated it. The, 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 we would like to highlight the importance of having knowledge about the uh, maritime zones itself. Uh, right now, in our regulation uh, under the Act Number 17, year 2008, the uh, Director General of Sea Transportations uh, mainly works on the territorial seas and archipelagic waters related with the safety of navigation and marital, marine environmental protections. And then there is another uh, pictures of the uh, archipelagic waters and others related with maritime zones. And another one that my uh, important that is related with the rights of passage right of passage and uh, navigation is actually very important is uh, after the maritime zone the right of passage of ships is also important that uh, important issues that need to be highlighted because this issue among others are the most frequent issues that being discussed on daily activities in our in, in the real world i mean and then in, 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 in our uh, in our ministry, in our director of general of sea transportation, the, the 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 most important one is we need to know about this the right of passage and the maritime zone itself. Uh, we uh, know based on UNCLOS, there are several uh, rights of passage. The first one is the right of innocent passage. It's regulated under Part Two of UNCLOS. It applies at the territorial seas and archipelagic waters. And the coastal states may adopt the laws and regulations uh, with the implementation of the United Passage, including those related with the safety of navigation and marine mortal, marine environmental protections. Uh, the one that being uh, highlighted in the new clause that I would like to highlight that as well, that the foreign ships exercising, exercising the right of innocent passage to the territorial sea shall comply with all such laws which relate uh, which uh, comply with the uh, international regulation relating to the provision of collision at sea the prevention of collision at sea the content in itself was developed by the international maritime organizations and then the, the, the rights of transit passage the the rights of transit passage is actually uh, uh, the, the the implemented we are implementing it at the uh, in Indonesia we are implementing it in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore and it's regulated to the part three of UNCLOS, and it's the, for the purposes of continuous and expeditious transits of the strait between one part of the high seas and exclusive, exclusive economic zone and another part of the high seas or an exclusive economic zones. The most important one that the coastal state shall not deny, hampering, or impairing the right of transit passage. And then uh, we come into the rights of archipelagic sea land passage. The, the, the rights of archipelagic sea land passage is actually being uh regulated on the part four of room class and uh, the, it's almost the same with the uh rights of transit passage uh it's for the purpose of continuous and expeditious passage between one part of the high seas or exclusive economic zones and another part of the high seas and exclusive economic zones and again the coastal states are not um, denying hampering or impairing the rights of a triple sea land passage and the coastal states may designate sea lanes, which includes all normal passage routes used as routes for international navigation. And the question right now, in Indonesia and Asia Project Sea Lane uh, itself, is it considered as a full destination or only with partial destinations? So prior to the, uh, the adoption of Indonesian Asia Project Sea Lane in 1998, it's, there are no regulations, and there are no guidelines from IMO that regulated the uh, destination of the Archibald Sea Lane, whether it's full destination and partial destination. However, because of our proposals, the IMO developed this uh, guidance, uh, general provision on the Archibald Sea Lane passage, uh, which give us some kind of a guidance on how the, 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 the Archibald State could designate the archipelagic sea lane, whether it's fully designated or partially designated. Unfortunately, in Indonesia right now, we are still considered as a partial designated archipelagic sea lane. It means 
that uh, these ships uh, could implement the rights of archipelagic sea lane passage to the other routes that they consider normal to be used for international navigations. Aside from those three archipelagic sea lane passage that uh, archipelagic sea lane that have been the, adopted by the IMO for Indonesia, and of course the other one is the freedom of high seas, where and the is and, and the high seas also they have the freedom of navigation is under part uh, seven of the protocols. Now we going into the uh, wait. The, 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 the correlation between UNCLOS and safety of navigation when from marine environmental protections. The issues related with the uh, safety of navigation and marine environmental protections is very related with the maritime zones, including its right of passage and navigations. And in UNCLOS, it's clearly stated that the states shall comply with the international regulations, which adopted by the Competent international organization in dealing with the safety of navigation and marine environmental protections. This competent international organization also developed those conventions uh, and then also the, the guidelines and other technical uh, guide, uh, guidelines or technical uh, guidance for uh, the enhancements of the safety of navigation and marine environmental protection itself. And I would like to give you the, the information that, that the key element on the uh, safety of navigation and marine environmental protection is the strengthening, to strengthening the roles of the state as coastal states, port states, and flag states. The, the roles of coastal states, we know that we need to provide, as a coastal state, we have the rights and obligations to provide the infrastructures for the ships coming to Indonesia that all of the infrastructure related with safety of navigation, for instance, the vessel traffic services, the ACE to navigation, is comply with international regulation. That's the uh, rights and obligation as a coastal state. And as a port state, we need to ensure that the foreign ships coming to our ports is actually comply with those international conventions. And we, as a flag states, we need to uh, understand uh, what international convention that need to be, uh, what standards need to be complied, need to be regulated into our own ships. That's the right of uh, regulation, rights and obligation as their flag states. And of course, the last one, the UNCLOS requires all states to protect and to preserve the marine environment, and the states should also cooperate in developing the international rules and regulations. And I uh, would like to inform you as well that the safety of navigation and running from the book station is actually uh, can be one issues. If you can see at, uh, in the pictures right now, uh, it is one of the accidents in the Singapore Straits where motor, uh, tank, one of the tanker is quite huge. Uh, it's, it's around uh, 300 meters tankers at a collision with the container vessels. And somehow uh, so many oil uh, spill in those waters. So that's why the safety of navigation and marine environmental protection is quite uh, two issues that can be, uh, cannot be separated. And then uh, the next one is about the national registry. Uh, I'm sure that I already give you uh, information, the importance of the, the, the we as a flag state uh, coastal states and also the port state to ensure the safety of navigation and marine environmental protections. Now, the flex states itself is very correlated with the ship registry. Why? Because the ship registry, when the sh we have those uh, 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 ships flying our uh, flag, it means that we need have the obligations to ensure that the ships comply with the uh, international regulation related with the standardization of the ships, the life-saving appliance, and others. So under the Article 91 of UNCLOS, uh, we can we have the doctrine of the Junian link. The ship registry itself, uh, it stated that every state shall fix the condition for the grant of the nationality of the ships. Those Junian link uh, doctrine, you can see it on the ICJ uh, cases uh, from the states in Guatemala uh, that it says about the effective nationality. So 
And the proposal for registration itself, uh, it, it has two functions. They have two functions. The first one will be the public law functions. It's uh, the confirmation of nationality and the right to fly the national flag and uh, the national regulatory jurisdictions. And the private law function, functions is about the prima facie evidence of title and ownership. And uh, as for as your information, uh, for your information, there are several types of registries. There are closed registry, a real connection, because this we have stringent condition of ownerships, manning and management and administrations. Open registry, the states permits ownership of ship by non-nationals, the employment of its ships with non-national is allowed. And then the secondary registry, the contract effect of the open registry, it permits the hiring of crews from other states and uh, the power boat, their boat charter registration. Uh, they can temporarily change of the flex during the duration of charter. Uh, two parties, uh, flex states of the owner and flex state of the charter. Now, after those uh, being mentioned about the competent uh, international organizations, uh, yet which been mentioned on the UNCLOS, the IMO is actually one of those competent international organizations, uh, which mentioned on the UNCLOS, aside from the ICAO, which related to the uh, aviation or something like that. The, the IMO is actually a specialized agency of the United Nations, which has the competence to generate international instruments on the safety and security at sea and protection of the marine environment. The mission of IMO itself is to promote safe, secure, and environmentally sound, efficient, and sustainable shipping through corporations. And uh, ISMO also worked together with a UN agency in promoting the objectives of the UN, including the uh, initiative which related with the sustainable development goals and others. And the present membership, uh, we had uh, 170 member states, three associate members, and observers from the shipping industries and other related stakeholders. And uh, again, for your information, the main bodies of the IMO, we had uh, assembly, councils, committees, the maritime environmental protections, maritime safety committee, the legal committee, the technical cooperation committee, and facilitation committee and other subcommittees. And if you see the pictures right now, our presidents actually uh, already uh, giving the necessary uh, address as or speech during the uh, one of the session of Marine Environmental Protection Company. He addresses that the importance of the uh, states to have corporations to uh, in dealing with these uh, security, safety, and protection of the marine environment. And uh, the IMO conventions. Uh, uh, earlier, Tehorin mentioned about the uh, convention in, in IMO, so many conventions, so many technical guidance, etc. Yes, actually, we have almost 53 conventions which adopted by the IMO, which covers several areas, including maritime safety and security, provision of marine pollution, liability compensation, uh, compensation, and others. And so many more and many more about the technical guide in itself because we had also non-treaty rules, the code standards, guidelines, manuals, and recommendations, circulars, and others. And uh, between the, the, the 53 convention, there are four pillars which consider as the most important maritime regulations on international shipping. The first one is SOLAS, International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, the STCW, International Convention on Standards of Training, Intercertification, and Watchkeeping for Seafarers, and then MARPOL, International Convention for the Prevention of the Pollution for Ships, and the Maritime Labor Conventions. And I would like to highlight that it's true. The problem is how we implementing it. That's why I move under the assembly. They decide to have the mechanism with so-called as an IMO mandatory, mandatory member states of the team. The objective of this IMO mandatory member states of the team is to ensure that the uh, states, the member states of IMO can have those, can effectively implementing the IMO conventions. So uh, the representatives of IMO will go into the uh, member states, they will check whether 
the implementations of the animal convention uh, is already comply with the animal conventions, or there are some kind of uh, deficiencies that related with those conventions, with this, those implementations. So in, in this case, in Indonesia, we will have those audit. Uh, the, the next one will be come with, with the health and 2023, if I'm not mistaken. So we are preparing right now. So the first thing that we will, they will see with their, our national regulations already comply with international regulation. And then whether those, uh, the, the, the regulation that being implemented already Lelefan uh, already comply with those uh, conventions. And then I would like to uh, explain about the uh, SOLAS itself. Uh, the SOLAS convention is regarded as the most important of the, in all international treaties concerning the safety of regional ships. Uh, if you know that Titanic disaster of 1912 is the trigger for the IMO or the international societies to develop the uh, safety of life at sea conventions. And uh, the main objective itself is we would like, uh, they would like to specify minimum standard for the construction, equipment, and operation of the ships. Uh, and also it's to ensure they're compatible with their safety. And it is the duty of the flag states to ensuring their ships comply with source requirement while the port state control inspection is conducted that is sure that the ship from the other flag states comply with the solid requirements when they come into our port. And the solid convention includes uh, several articles, uh, each setting out in the general obligation or management of uh, procedures followed by an annex and invited to the 12 chapters. And, and actually in solid, they also uh, have those uh, template of the certifications so every uh, every aspects of the ships need to need to be certified. For instance, for instance, the life saving appliance it need to have uh, it need to follow the standards. It need to comply the standards, and we need to prove it under one certificate that we need to bring it when we uh, are navigating. So not just that the stability, the machinery, electrical installation, and others should be checked. Ready communications. And then the uh, the carriage of goods, and uh, especially the dangerous cargoes and others, also specified on those uh, solace. It's very technical, but it's very important to ensure that the ships uh, already comply with it because uh, the, 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 the the standard itself uh, was developed based on the agreement of the state city, and of course the agreement by the shipping industry as well. And then the next one is about the uh, MARPOL, the prevention of the pollution from ships. The, the conventions is the main international convention covering prevention of pollution of the marine environment by ships from operational or accidental causes. The MARPOL convention was adopted on 2 November 1973. And there are protocols after that that uh, adopted in response to uh, the thank you incidents in 76, 77. Uh, the marble itself, we are seeking to achieve the complete elimination of international pollution of the marine environment by oil and other harmful substance and the minimization of accidental discharge of this, such a substance. So if you look at the annexes of this uh, marble, it's regulated the, uh, the, the, the pollution from uh, oil and then uh, the noxious liquid substance and then uh, the, the uh, harmful substance carried by sea in package, and then sewage, garbage, and air pollution. Uh, the, the, this uh, air pollution is related to the CO2 that being produced by the ship itself and other related aspects. So, and then uh, the next one is about the standards of training certification watchkeeping for seafarers. This convention is actually uh, related with those standardization or certifications. Uh, when uh, the Oregon State does the masters need to obtain the license? Yes. And the masters and all of the seafarers need to 
have certifications before they are selling. So uh, this uh, STCW convention is regulating on how the seafarers uh, should have those basic requirements on training and the certification and watch giving, uh, uh, was it a watch keeping uh, for seafarers on an international level. Uh, previously, those standards were established by in the federal government, you see without reference to practices but based on this SCCW conference, we have those similar standards for all states all over the world. So we have one uh, sources, one source to be implemented during the uh, for the CFR itself, and it also have the SCCW code, and it contain it contain the. Uh, further practices associated with the certificates of competency, uh, requirements of hours of work and rest, and then uh, requirements for able seafarers, modern technology, and until the dynamic positioning systems. And aside from this STCW, uh, the IMO also uh, adopted STCW for fisheries. So for fishing uh, ships, fishing boats, they have their own uh, standards of training, certification, and watch keeping for seafarers. Because uh, based on the uh, observation made by the IMO, it's very hard for the seafarers who comes from the fishing ships to comply with the STCW convention. That's why they made special regulatory uh, conventions they made for the uh, fisheries vessels. Uh, and then uh, the next one is very important as well. It's related with the human element. If the other, the one that we mentioned is about this STCW is related with certifications, uh, and then the uh, related with the watch keeping and the, 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 the standards of uh, what is it, uh, training itself. Now we are talking about the conventions that uh, protect the rights of seafarer itself. It's called the Maritime Library Conventions. It's related with the Article 94 of INCLOS, which stated that the states, uh, the duties and obligation of a flat state with regard to labor condition, crewing, and settlement matters on ship that it flies flag. While the MLC is actually comprehensive international labor convention that was adopted by ELC of the ILO. And it's, it's like uh, some kind of a codifications uh, with, uh, that uh, based on those already found in the maritime labor instruments convention and recommendations, which adopted by the ILO between 1920 and 1996 with some uh, several updates. And it consolidates and revises the existing international law in, uh, in this matter. The basic aims of this MLC is, again, to, to, to provide the protection of, uh, the, of for the seafarers and uh, give the protection of the rights of the seafarer itself and to establish a, a level playing field for countries and ship owners committed to providing distance working uh, and living condition for seafarers. If you're looking at the maritime labor convention, so many items that being uh, regulated over there, uh, the, the rights for uh, seafarers to have those uh, re, uh, what is it, uh, agreement with the ship owners, the, 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 the rights for them to have the facilities and ships, the rights for them to have a proper uh, uh, location for uh, sleeping or something like that. It's being regulated in this convention. That's why they said uh, the convention is sometimes called as a seafarer's bills of rights. Um, it's so many things that being regulated in those four main uh, conventions. Uh, it took me more than a year. There are more than eight subjects related with this uh, conventions. That's why I would not give you details information about this one probably you can just read it by yourself but i will give you the introduction itself uh, the prior uh the uh implementation of this in conventions now i would like 
to in, uh, comes into the uh, uh, practical side of it, the, the practical side of the UNCLOS. The first one I would like to give you the examples is related with the uh, how the UNCLOS, especially part three of UNCLOS, could enhance the safety of navigations and many of mental protections in the streets of Malacca in Singapore. So uh, if you may aware that the streets of Malacca in Singapore is considered as one of the choke points of the world, uh, more than 85,000 of ships passing through the state every year. And uh, it has prior uh, this, the, 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 the adoption of the cooperative mechanism to serve Malacca in Singapore, there are several huge uh, accidents uh, occurred in the streets of Malacca in Singapore. And so many uh, critical areas within the uh, traffic servers and seams in the streets of Malacca in Singapore. So uh, we need to do something over there. That's why in 2007, uh, based on the Article 43 of UNCLOS, uh, the little states, little states introduced the cooperative mechanisms to enhance the safety of navigation and marine environmental protection within the Straits. Based on the state Article 43 of UNCLOS, we managed to invite not only the other little states, but usual states, shipping industries, and other stakeholders and invite them to contribute voluntarily to enhance the safety of navigation, marine environmental protection in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. What they conducted, what they give us is the one, they give the direct funding to us. And aside from that, they give, them, give us the uh, in-kind contributions. So a study is something like that. So they give their efforts together with the, the literal states to enhance its safety of navigation and marine environmental protection within, in, within the streets. And uh, it answers actually the issues of internationalization of the streets, because we would like to show Indonesia, Malaysia and Singapore would like to show that this, uh, this uh, streets can be um, managed by the three literal states within the help of the other little states without, uh, uh, with still considering the part three of UNCLOS itself. So the sovereignty of the uh, states is still respected, while the safety of navigations and the marine environmental protection can be maintained. There are uh, more than uh, 15 projects right now that being uh, developed under the corporate mechanism in the Church of Malacca in Singapore. And it, affect, it was effective to reduce the number of accidents and marine pollution in the Straits and manage to invite contribution from the other states. The main body of the cooperative mechanism is one, the cooperative mechanism forum, the project coordination committee and H navigation fund. And if you want to know further about this issue, you may visit our websites, cmsoms.com. Uh, if you want to have a further study related with this cooperative mechanisms, you can may uh, contact me and we can may discuss about this. And then the next one is about the destination of the traffic separation schemes in Sundan Lombok State. Uh, it's related with the implementation of uh, Article 53 of UNCLOS. Uh, if you may know that the Sundan Lombok Straits are to do the two most important shipping routes used for international navigations. Uh, more than 52,000 ships are transiting the Sundan Straits every year, while more than 38,000 ships transiting the Lombok Strait every year. Based on Article 53 of UNCLOS, in order to reduce the risk of collisions, the Archipelagic states could designate the traffic separation in ships in, within the uh, Archipelagic sea lanes. And after a long discussion uh, from the 2002 until 2019, uh, the IMO adopted the TSS within those two straits. And until now, we, we, we already implementing it. And it was effective in reducing the collision as well as the marine pollution within the streets. What we do during the discussions, uh, when we Give the, gave the proposals to IMO. 
we have several questions from the others uh, user states and the flag states, uh, especially from Australia, from the United States, and then the Japan and Korea and others. Uh, the, the main uh, the main question will be uh, whether this dissemination of the SS will hamper the rights of archipelagic sea lane passage. And every occasion, we always stated that we will not hamper, impair, or suspend the rights of archipelagic sea lane passage. In fact, with this dissemination of the, with the destination adoption of the traffic service and seems in some sustainable streets, we're trying to enhance the safety and marine environmental protection on those two streets. So uh, we have extensive discussion among the states, and uh, fortunately, uh, fortunately, uh, on 2019, uh, the TSS on the archipelagic ceiling. And then uh, we're going into the uh, marine environmental protection issues uh, based on the provision on the part of 12th of NCLOS. The IMO developed the tools or initiatives uh, related to particularly sensitive sea areas uh, to protect the marine environment. There are uh, the resolutions that regulated this one, the re resolution on the revised guideline for the identification and dissemination of particular sensitive areas. So uh, the main uh, highlight of the PSSA that a particularly sensitive areas uh, is an area of the marine environment that needs protections to measures by IMO because of its significance, significance of ecological conditions, socioeconomic conditions, scientific attributes that may be vulnerable by damage by internal shipping activities. So there are three key elements. Uh, there are areas that need to be protected. Uh, and then uh, there are uh, vulnerability of damage from the international shipping activities. And the important one, there are there is associated protective measures under the PSSA that need to be designated uh, within this PSSA framework. So, for instance, uh, Indonesia, we propose to have uh, the PSSA on the Lombok Strait. Uh, the we still ongoing right now. It's still ongoing right now, and we will give the proposal probably uh, end of this year or in the next year. And uh, there are 17 areas of this in the world that already designated as PSSA. But in the case of Indonesia, the Lombok State, the PSSA of Indonesia will have PSS as a protective, associated protective measures. So the associated protective measures are not always uh, related with the safety, it's also related with marine environmental protections. It could be under the solas and also can be under the buffer. And then, uh, is it the area you may have interest with is related with the uh, regime of the liability and compensation for transporter oil damage resulting from offshore explorations and exploitation activities. Uh, you may aware about the Montara platform accident, which occurred in August 2009, uh, which uh, made huge impact on environmental, social, economic, uh, within the society, uh, at the vicinity of the uh, area of the uh, platform itself. After the accident, actually, uh, there are efforts to obtain an appropriate compensation from the responsible parties. However, it's difficult and complicated uh, for the society to have those uh, compensations because there are lack of reference for dispute settlement. There are no international legal instruments that addresses the issues of liability and compensation for transportary damage uh, resulting from the offshore explorations, exploitation activities effectively and comprehensively by the time. And each state, uh, they have uh, their own 
practices in dealing with the issues. And it limited on the regional instruments, which have restrictive effect in dealing with the state issues. And based on Article 182, 208, 124, uh, 235, and 253, Indonesia and other interested states, we uh, jointly proposed the new regime of the new international convention on the liability and compensation for oil damage resulting from offshore exploration and exploitation. However, due to the uh, kind of strong objection from those uh, other states, uh, I'm only agree to develop guidance on bilateral and regional agreement or arrangements. So right now, uh, after all of the efforts we already made, that uh, I'm well, uh, finally agree to develop those guidance, but only on the bilateral and regional agreements. So we. Uh, we uh, have those uh, model law to be improved by the uh, regional uh, agreements or by the bilateral agreements. And it's, this is the, uh, the, the example of the, 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 the rights of passage related with the, uh, what really happened uh, and the practice. Uh, so, uh, if you may aware, on 1998, uh, Indonesia had temporarily closed Sunda and Lombok states for military exercise. Uh, there's two uh, as uh, closer. There's two states by the time is considered as the routes normally used for international navigations. However. Under with far for close. Council states saw that Hanai hampering or impairing the rights of Archibaldic's land passage. While Indonesia already ratified the clause in 1995, and based on the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, we, the states is obliged to refrain from acts which would defeat the purpose of treaty when they already signed the treaty. So uh, the, 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 the the closure of the Sunda and Lombok Strait itself had the strong objections from the states, especially from the Australia, the US, uh, because by the time uh, we would like to show uh, the, the, that the both straits are under the Archipelagic land concepts, or Wawasan Nusantara, when all of the Archipelagic borders of Indonesia, we have full sovereignty of it. However, uh, the Australia government and um, US government stated that, that uh, these two straits is considered as routes normally used for international navigations. Uh, after uh, debates and others, uh, and yes, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the discussion about the rights of Archibaldic Zealand itself, uh, it comes to the conclusion that the Indonesia might uh, overrule or uh, might not implementing the part of UNCLOS. And then we had those Bowen incident in 2003, where American warships, USS Parkinson, with two frigates and one tanker, are implementing the rights of Achebegit's land passage to the east west routes close with the Bahrain Island and uh, it's close, very close with the northern part of Java Island. During the passage, five American uh, hornets maneuvering and went into attack mode above the Bahrain Island and disturb the commercial flights. Uh, if we look into the Article 53 of UNCLOS, the Archipelagic state does not listen if the Archipelagic state does not it designate uh, Archipelagic Sea Lane. Archipelagic Sea Lane passage applies on the routes which normally used for international navigations. While on the Article 39 of UNCLOS, the ships and a curve shall refrain from any threat or use of force against the sovereignty of the Archipelagic states and also refrain from any activities that might distract the continuous and expeditious transits. Uh, we had several questions about this Bowen incident. And, uh, uh, the does the 
uh, U.S. Uh, uh, car, for instance, uh, they are uh, implementing their rights of logic ceiling passage, and whether uh, they are uh, implementing their rights or the obligation under the Article 39 of clause. Uh, based on the findings, uh, based on the study that been made by several scholars, uh, it was stated that actually the uh, U.S. car fencing actually uh, uh, not implementing the Article 39 clause because they are threatening or uh, they're using a force against the sovereignty of the HBLC lane while they are uh, implementing the right of HBLC lane passage. And this is the newest uh, cases. Uh, on 2021, in case you have heard these issues on the news, the anti-horse and anti-fria Panama, Panama was caught conducting illegal activities in Indonesian Archipelago Sea Lane, number one. Uh, the two, those two ships anchored on the Archipelago Sea Lane Turn off the automatic identification system, conducting illegal dumping and ship, tra ship transfer activities without any notification or permit from the administrations. While on the part four of clause, they uh, stated that our triple excellent passage applies for the ships which navigate for the purpose of continuous and expeditious passage within one part of the high seas and other part of high seas or exclusive economic zones. For Article 39 UNCLOS, it stated that ships should proceed without delay and refrain from any activities other than those incident to their normal modes of continuous and expeditious transits. There are two questions actually. Yeah, it's my kind of homework for you. So does this uh, does all foreign ships needed to use archipelagic sealing when face stay navigating to the waters of Indonesia? And the second question, does this two ships, the Kain Freya and Wimpy Horse, still implementing the rights of archipelagic land passage when they did those illegal activities? And can we implement our national law? This is, uh, can be answered by looking at the those two provisions on the part four of clause and article 39 in clause. And then, this is uh, one of the areas that are now being uh, discussed extensively. It's related with the e-navigations. Everything right now is conducted on electro within electronic means to assess the vessels navigate. Uh, based on the IMO, e-navigation is actually the harmonized collection, integration, exchange, presentations, analysis of maritime information on board and ashore by electronic means to enhance bird-to-bird -bird navigation and related service and for safety and security and protection of the marine environment. So there are necessity to use technology, technology or electronic means to enhance bird-to-bird -bird navigations and the safety, of, uh, safety, security and protection of the marine environment. Uh, we uh, in Ayala and in IMO, we identify 16 uh, maritime service portfolios under the framework of e-navigation that can be further developed. This uh, 16 uh, services is being developed by flag states, by the coastal states to improve the safety itself. So uh, right now we haven't had any uh, legally binding uh, conventions about the e-navigations, but the IMO already uh, it adopted two resolutions uh, on the guidance on the definition and harmonization of the format and structure of maritime surface in the context of e-navigations and the initial description of maritime surfaces under the context of e-navigations. Uh, Indonesia right now, we are trying to uh, involve on this initiatives related with the e-navigations. We conducted test beds related with the palatite surface and others 
that may uh, develop the services on the virtual bird navigation and also the safety and security at sea. And I know there are questions about the, uh, the, the, the submarine. Uh, and currently, there are no international legal instruments that address the issues of autonomous and unmanned vessels. So we divided in IMO, we divided two autonomous and unmanned vessels into the autonomous, which is capable of independent decision making without involvement of a human operators. This is including the marine autonomous surface ships, autonomous surface vessels, and autonomous underwater vessels. This, the sea glider is actually under the autonomous underwater vessels. And the other one will be the unmanned. Uh, the unmanned is always monitored and under positive control of human operator. It's uh, divided into the unmanned underwater vessels and unmanned surface vessels. Uh, the progress of discussion at the IMO right now, IMO agreed to form a maritime autonomous surface ships agenda working group to discuss and formulate the legal instruments. While there are one guideline that already produced by those uh, working group is the interim guideline for maritime autonomous surface ships trials and uh, based on the sea glider accidents uh, that uh, you may wear, we trying to conduct a study to formulate a national regulation, to write a national regulation of the autonomous and the unmanned vessels. And as for the accidents of this, uh, the, 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 uh, the submarine itself, uh, we have one convention that are already been, uh, been ratified by Indonesia, is the uh, search and rescue conventions. Actually, uh, the coastal states need to, 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 to deploy their resources to conduct uh, this search and rescue operation, regardless what the ship is, whether it's autonomous ships or, I don't know, not, it's the, 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 the submarine or the merchant ships. We need to have the obligations to conducted these search and rescue operations. Of course, we don't have those uh, regulation in place uh, to deal in dealing with this uh, submarine or the marine autonomous ships or unmanned ships. But in terms of search and rescue, we still have the obligations to uh, give a proper uh, search and rescue operation to help the passengers or the crews within the vessels. Uh, so, uh, for in answering uh, or in and, uh, questions earlier, how about the submarine? Or how we could help them? How we can help them? So, there are uh, some kind of a limitation from us because under the limit of uh, under certain depth of the waters, we kind of have some kind of uh, limitations to do the SAR activities. So that's why in this case, the submarine was uh, sunk under the 800 meters or something like that. It's very difficult to conduct search and rescue operations, but uh, we did the operations uh, it doesn't show on the news, but the uh, search and rescue agency, as well as the director general of sea transportation and other agency, we are hand in hand together. We conducted those uh, inspections. And about the wreck uh, removals, uh, about the salvage itself, the, the wreck uh, or removal of uh, the ships sank within the area, certain areas. Uh, we actually have the MO convention. Now. I I think we haven't ratified it yet. It's about the wreck removal conventions. Uh, it's regulated that there are uh, obligations of the coastal states to conduct salvage operations to take the wreck out of the locations. However, you need to be aware that the uh, selfish operations usually needed uh, 
so many resources in terms of funding and others. So usually it handled by the insurance company. So it's related with insurance or something like that. So that's why the wreck and re removal of wreck on the selfish operations is uh, something that uh, we are now discussed it, whether we would like to ratify it or not. And I think that's my last presentation. Uh, um, my, my suggestion for all of you that uh, the first one is related with the numbers. Uh, we need, first, we need to have understanding on the key figures on the maritime transport to understand the importance of the maritime transport itself. And then uh, we need to take a look at the statistical, statistical uh, numbers being, that being released by the uh, certain uh, UN uh, bodies related, relevant, that may improve your knowledge related to maritime transport. And then uh, the third one, I think you need to explore yourself because when you when we discuss about the maritime law, it's, it's actually very broad aspects. It's not only law of the sea. We have, they have the public law side of it. We have private law side of it. So, so you, you, it may be uh, related with the carriage of goods, marine insurance, and others. So, so many things to be uh, discussed over here, but I would like to focus more on this uh, public international law aspects on the safety of navigation and marine environmental protections. And if you have further questions, don't hesitate to ask me. And if you want to do study or review on particular issues related with safety of navigation and marine environmental protection for, uh, related with the IMO Convention, please don't hesitate to ask me. Maybe uh, that's all for me, Bu Orin. Are you still there? I cannot see you. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. I'm listening. I'm so amazed. Oh my god! Oh my god! During the presentation, I was like, "Oh my god, so awesome!" It's so fruitful. So many informations, as you said before, when our previous discussion. There are so many rules, so many instruments that uh, uh, related to these matters. Uh, so, and this, yes, and then I have so many questions. Then uh, I did because. Uh, uh, there are a lot of cases related to the things that you mentioned, but maybe uh, some of the questions are addressed by the students, some of the students raise it in as their, their final thesis, but the description, but um, before I go on with my questions, I will let the audience first to ask you, I see questions uh, here on the chat box from, let me see, I see, I think I have Renata here, uh, Renata, uh, are you here? Uh, Maybe you can address your, whoa, we have a lot of hands. I, I also have Kang Anom. Uh, hi, Anom. How are you? Ooh, you always uh, uh, attend all of the conversation. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> nice to see Anom again here. And also, yeah. then we have Gary and also Mbak Diaz, Anugrah Diaz Tutsi from uh, ONS Solo. So, but first we go to Renata first. Renata, please, you can address the questions to Kang Adit. Thank you, Ibu Orin. Thank you, Bapak Nanditya, for the opportunity. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Renata. Please allow me to deliver uh, my questions. Under Article 44 of UNCLOS, countries bordering straits have an obligation to provide information regarding to any danger of uh, navigation. And in this article, there is a general principle of international law called duty to cooperate. And one of it is information sharing or appropriate publicity. However, if there is a country which refuses to share information regarding incidents, for example, armed robbery that occurred in its territorial waters, uh, the first question is, is the action of the state who holds back the information can be called as a substantive violation of international law? And what is the state's responsibility under international law? And is there any legal consequences of the violations in relations between countries? That was my question. Thank you in advance, sir. Thank you. So 
another question first, maybe three questions first. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> so, uh, so we just uh, collect the question first, can I then you answer or you will directly answer the question? Uh, I think we can have three questions first and I can answer it together. Okay, uh, then I, I will please, uh, Kang Anom, please, uh, you can directly <laughs> say the questions. Kang Anom, you should Anom. ask in other platforms. You can use, just use WhatsApp or something. <laughs> It's okay. So, <laughs> Kang Anam is coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So uh, I think it's, it's a nice discussion because we can see uh, some other point of view from the other ministry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Teorin. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adit. I think this uh, you, Adit. Have, you have presented a very valuable uh, presentation to <laughs> everyone. I think what you have has uh, is very, very uh, enriching, especially for me. If everybody would like no, to know right. that uh, Dr. Adit here is my mentor. <laughs> so he's my, he's a very, He's an expert in maritime affairs, so no. uh, this is, he's a very, very uh, <laughs> right person to answer these kinds of questions. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Adit, my question is that um, under Article 26, uh, Law of the Sea Convention, that states, uh, state parties are not allowed to collect fees from ships passing through their territorial sea. Now, the wording of the article says only territorial sea. Now, I was wondering whether this also applies to other areas as well. Uh, let's say, for instance, does it also apply to the archipelagic waters and probably even further uh, outward in the EEZ probably. Now, if there is uh, no fee fees collecting are allowed, uh, what is the best way would you think that, um, that the state parties can obtain economic benefit from ships uh, that are merely passing through uh, but not entering the, the, that state party's uh, port? So I think uh, please indulge me with your... Um, bright ideas on this part, Adit. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Kang Anom. Uh, uh, Kang Anom. <laughs> Actually, Kang Anom already know the answers, but I don't know why he has the questions. <laughs> Kang Anom. <laughs> because the students hasn't know yet, they haven't know yet, so Kang Adit, so we'll just let him. <laughs> so, so, we already, so we can also know. Kang Giri, maybe I will let the uh, let Mbak Diaz uh, ask first, uh, because uh, she's, a, she's a guest. Uh, Mbak Diaz, please uh, have your questions to Kang Adit directly. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Good morning, Teh Corin and uh, Mr. Adit. Uh, thank you for your inspiring uh, discussions for this morning. So I'd like to ask about, uh, you, you mentioned about the TSS, and we already have two TSS in Indonesia based on our uh, territory area in Indonesia. So we already have TSS in Sunda and Lombok. So my question is, uh, is there any projections in the following time for Indonesia to submit another TSS? Because actually, when we mentioned about the SS, we, we experienced several incidents. For, for example, uh, the incident in Raja Ampat uh, caused by the foreign, <laughs> by the foreign yacht. Yeah, and it's really, uh, I think we, yeah, we have a lot of uh, uh, so many, uh, quote unquote, more negative impact rather than the, the, the positive impact from the activities of tourism activities over there. So is it possible for the following time, uh, I'm not sure, is, this, is it will, will be pro proposed by your ministry or probably another institution? Is it, is it possible for Indonesia to submit another TSS to protect our environment, not only about the uh, safety and uh, transportation routes in our, our country, but what about the, the environment impact for our in, uh, for our oceans environment in the future time? That's my first question. And then the second one is about uh, we we already uh, this uh, we already established about the the archipelagic ceilings from the north to south, but we we haven't uh, I think proposed the the the, the, the others uh, route for the west to east uh, ceiling. So what about the the projections in the future times? for the whole archipelagic ceilings uh, established by the Indonesian government. That's my question. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Tehwarin. Uh, thank you, Mbak Diaz. Kang Adit, actually, I, I see from the chat box, there's um, uh, Ibu Reni from KJRI, uh, KJRI Kaka. Um, I think the question is similar with Mbak Diaz. But uh, Mbak Reni, if you have uh, some particular which is different uh, with Mbak Diaz, maybe you can also address the question di directly. 
Is Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, Maureen. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Adit. No, <laughs> Dr. Reni is it sure. Hi, Reni, how are you? Fine, thank you. Oh, okay, <laughs> so it's ministerial meeting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Adit, I would like to ask you about the further question concerning the proposal for Lombok Strait as the uh, for particular sensitive sea area. And my question is more on the what is the reason behind the proposal? And is there any special uh, underwater features that uh, that might be uh, becoming the reason of uh, the, the Indonesian government decided to to propose for the PSSA in that area, and also what kind of a APM that would be conducted uh, beside the TSS, and and maybe one more question, if it's okay, I would like I would like to know uh, about the Indonesian proposal for the exchange of crew in the uh, pandemic era. That, that is one of the uh, what I read in the in the internet. It is also one of our success effort in order to uh, about the exchange of crew. Maybe you can elaborate more on that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maureen. It's nice to see you. Thank you, Bereni. Yes. Thank you. Kang Adit, uh, uh, I think uh, we, we, uh, I will just let pa, uh, Kang Geri to ask a question. Is it OK? I, I don't want yeah. to leave him alone. OK. <laughs> Promise it will be. Okay. It, won't, it won't be very very long question. It's just a short question. <laughs> I promise. Okay, you. please hear it. If it's okay, uh, thank you, Boring. Thank you, uh, Kang Adit, for the enlightenment um, this morning. Uh, actually, I want to bring up um, rather uh, recent issue uh, negotiated by Indonesia, which is the concept note of regional convention on marine environmental protection in Arafura and Timor Sea, uh, between Indonesia, Australia, East Timor, and PNG. Um, Kang Adit, uh, as we know that um, marine environmental protection is highly regulated under UNCLOS, UNCLOS 1982, and also, as I see from your name tag, IMO, <laughs> IMO conventions, and <laughs> IMO conventions. Um, my questions, maybe this is a very simple question. Why? I, do we need uh, this regional cooperation for specific area and uh, Tahrani already said uh, Lombok Strait and also now I, will, I want to uh, for, put forward the Arafura and Timor Sea. Um, yes, I know this is a very sensitive area because this is um, the area is um, uh, according to its geographical conditions. It is very vital for circulation between Pacific and also Indian Ocean. But why? Why is it uh, is it not enough having such a comprehensive um, in international for international level uh, regulation under UNCLOS 1982 and also IMO conventions? Thank you very much. I have, actually, I have. Uh, a lot of following up questions, but I will um, ask you later, maybe. <laughs> or if I have time, I will ask you in this forum. Thank you very much. Your... Thank you, Kangeri. Okay, Kang Adit, please. The floor is mm. yours. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I think Pa Anom and Bureni is way more expert than me. They already know the answers, actually. The first questions about the uh, the Article 44 of UNCLOS had been raised by Bu Renata, if I'm not mistaken, is it? Yeah, Bu Renata. Thank you for your questions about the uh, duty of to cooperate and giving the uh, publication itself. So uh, actually, Article 44, if we look at the article itself, is the uh, obligations of the states to inform all of the other states about what the conditions related with the safety of navigations and marine environmental protection in one state. Usually, we had those uh, which so called as a maritime safety information being uh, informed to the uh, coastal radio stations or to the uh, NAFTEC stations to inform that there are some kind of uh, uh, accidents in particular areas and something like that. As, yes, one of 
the fun function of this maritime safety information is related with the armed uh, robbery. Uh, I, I think uh, as for the this armed robbery, uh, I think Anom Burini will add this because they are expert on this. Uh, uh, yes, we had those uh, in IMO. If there is some kind of armed robbery or something like piracy, we need to uh, inform IMO to the uh, they have so-called as a GSIS, something like that. So we can have uh, the newest information about what really occurred in the United States. Uh, while you, the, the one that you mentioned about the corporations uh, in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, we do have those corporations. We exchange information within the United States, in Asia, Malaysia, and Singapore. We haven't had any travel yet related with the exchange of information. But in terms of if one country uh, does not providing enough information related with the armed robbery, I'm not sure whether this could be considered as a substantive violation of Article 44 of the Code itself. Because uh, we need to check that the problem, the root causes of it, is it related with their ability to give the information? Is it related with their policy to not to share the, the information itself? So I think we need to see the root causes, why they not give the information. If you want to have the further detail about those information, you may look at the, uh, the, the, the IMO. Uh, in my sec, the first slides that I show you, I show, you saw you earlier, is really, I have one link. You can check it, you can click it and so many information about the armor or really something like that, including the statistics. So uh, about the cooperation, I'm not sure whether it's substantive violations, but you need to check what the root causes. I think that's my questions. And then uh, and my, the second questions, oh, sorry, uh, is from Pa Anom. Ah, pa Anom, you already know the answer. Should I answer this? <laughs> But that's okay. Students member probably doesn't know, uh, but do yes. not know about this kind of yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Pa Anom, uh, our uh, ambassador Anom, and <laughs> for your question about the Article 26 of UNCLOS. Yes, it's true. The Article 26 of UNCLOS does not allow states to collect fees from ships passing through the territorial seas. Actually, it's including the those on archipelagic waters. So. Uh, it applies, so we need to give specific services to specials so we can obtain something from them, so we can take the fees from them. So, for instance, uh, the ships passing through the passes of Sunda and Lombok Straits, we cannot uh, collect the fees from them because they are passing through the streets, but we may give them special uh, particular services which is related with the I don't know, services on um, crew, ex crew exchange, and then the ship to ships, and then uh, anchorage areas or something like that, or uh, the uh, technological sides of it. If we can give them a more appropriate uh, information or services based on the new technology, the, the one that I mentioned about e-navigations, probably we can collect them from them, but it's, uh, voluntary, we may they may use it or they may not use it, but uh, we can explore more about the usage of e navigations to collect the fees from them. What is the e navigations? Probably we can give them uh, the, 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 the newest uh, technologies related with the depth itself. The depth or the, the, the uh, risk assessment uh, of what is it? Uh, systems that being implemented in our TTS or something like that, and we can give them on web-based uh, services that can be used from them. This is just one example on how we can uh, obtaining economic benefit from ships if they are passing through the street. So my answer will be, uh, we need to give them a proper and particular services that can be used by them voluntarily and like, uh, for instance, uh, the ship to ship, the anchorage areas, 
the uh, Greek change areas or something like that. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, pa, uh, Ambassador Anon, for your uh, questions. And then the- uh, Guided, another... guided. Yes, yes. Before, before we move on to, to the, the next uh, question, so yeah, I just but... want to confirm, is this kind of debatable? Hello, guided? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, can, you may answer it. Uh, is it? Is that is that issue is a debatable issue between the ministries? Is it yes? <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no I'm sure. Let oh, no. uh, Mr. Anong answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. <laughs> okay, please proceed. <laughs> thank you. And uh Bu Anugrah, thank you for your questions uh about the TSS. Yes, we adopted uh I I'm adopted to TSS recently in Sunda and Lombok Straits. And is, you asked about the projections. Is there any way we can adopt another uh, TSS in other areas? My, my uh, answer will be, before we propose a particular uh, proposals to IMO, we need to check whether this area meets IMO criteria. I'm more, uh, what is it, uh, requirement, uh, so they could adopt it. The first thing they will ask whether the area is frequently used for international navigations. If not, there's no use for us to propose the TSS to the uh, IMO. In terms of uh, PES, uh, the TSS on Raja Ampat, actually, uh, based on the, our regulations, we already uh, implement some kind of ships routing over there. We have uh, one way, two way routes uh, being designated on Raja Ampat. So it's not only TSS acted as a way to promote safety of navigations. But based on the general provision on ship routing, uh, this is one particular uh, document under the SOLAS. The coastal states could develop and could implement the other, uh, uh, what is it, uh, ship routing using our own national legislations. So uh, the first thing, uh, we need to check whether this area is used for international navigations, then we can uh, uh, it, give the right proposal to IMO. And uh, the projection itself, uh, we are still uh, review several areas that are still considered uh, that consider important to be uh, designated uh, to be designated with the SS, but uh, we haven't had any conclusion yet. But uh, we will, we will find the right solution because uh, when we uh, propose the TSS, uh, we need to have uh, resources in terms of for the study itself and so many things to do. Uh, the TSS in Sunday and Lombok State, for your information, we started the study from 2002 within the help of the government of Japan. So for 2002, finally, we can adopt it in 2019. So, <laughs> so yeah, we need to be aware whether the, the resources that we will give is, will be, I don't know, is sufficient or something like that. We need to carefully address the issues from each area. But again, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, ship routing can be implemented using the national legislations. As for the archipelagic ceiling, as I mentioned, on to, to 1998, when we proposed the archipelagic ceiling, our archipelagic ceiling is still considered as the partial designated archipelagic ceiling. It's still not fully designated, it's partial. It means when, uh, based on general provision on archipelagic ceiling, uh, the one that being produced by, adopted by the IMO, it means that the ships could still use the other routes normally used for international navigations. Uh, probably the west and east uh, 
was it? Uh, Archipelagic sea and land can be one of the answers for this one. But again, we need to have comprehensive study for this. We need to engage uh, the uh, in terms of uh, security or something like that to to designate west and east west and east uh, archipelagic sea lane. So uh, we need to have uh, some kind of feedback from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from the Ministry of Defense, from the Navy, whether we can uh, designate uh, the west and east. But for your information, again, we are still partial uh, designated archipelagic ceiling. <clears throat> and the next questions about the uh, press essay from Ibu uh, Ambassador Remy. How are you, Ibu Remy? <laughs> and uh, thank you for your excellent questions. Uh, here, she asked about uh, the reasons behind the proposals. Uh, actually, in Lombok Street, uh, we have so many socio-economic conditions that can be a background for our proposals. Uh, if you are aware, there are Nusa Penida, Gili Trawang, and so many tourism activities over there. And don't forget that the area, the Lombok Strait, is also considered as a coral triangle initiatives area. So there are corals, rich of corals over there. So, so many things uh, can be described and can be uh, was it, uh, used for our proposals. Because again, uh, for FSSA, uh, the key element, the first one, uh, the, the Subi area to be protected. And then uh, there are socioeconomic condition on others that need to be protected. And it's vulnerable uh, with the international navigations and there are associated protective measures. And what kind of associated protective measures that will be conducted beside the TSS in the area? Uh, beside this TSS, uh, initially we have several uh, APMs. The first one, the TSS, the second one, mandatory ship reporting system, and the third one, the area to be avoided and something like that. Uh, the, this, this three uh, things is actually under the SOLAS, the Associated Protective Measures based on SOLAS. Why right now we are focusing on the TSS? When we look at the uh, PSSA guidelines, it was stated that the PSSA can be adopted based on the uh, assisting uh, measures, which is the TSS, or the proposed new measures. In, in this uh, case, if we uh, would like to pursue another uh, APMs, associated metric measures, it means that we need to have another proposals to another relevant subcommittees. For instance, for mandatory super reporting systems, it means that we need to have another uh, proposals to NCSR, MSC, before it comes into under uh, what was it? Uh, associated protective measures under the PSSA. So in terms of uh, Lombok Street, we are focusing to use the SS, the assisting measures that already adopted by the IMO to be used as our associated uh, protective measures. Uh, and then exchange of crews. Uh, thank you for remind me of this issues. I kind of forget about this one. <laughs> yes, on 1st of December 2020, uh, Indonesia and other uh, states, and other uh, UN states um, managed to propose uh, some kind of resolutions on the crew uh, exchange. Uh, the UN General Assembly adopted by consensus a resolution on international cooperation to address challenge faced by seafarer as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic to support global supply chains. The initiatives of Indonesia uh, had secure co-sponsorship for, I'm not sure whether more than 70 countries uh, and it's considered as a first General Assembly resolution concerning seafarers than global supply chains. And the seafarers issue is very important right now 
if you look at the website of the IMO, uh, they they promote. Uh, they they have a tagline that they consider that CFER is a key worker for uh, the global economy. Uh, that's why uh, the uh, member states of IMO and also UN that we have a corporations on to ensure how this uh, seafarers can be can, could work uh, in the sufficient environment, including when they need to uh, come to a shore or something like that. Um, probably uh, Ibu Ambassador Reni know this issues better than me. Probably in light you could enlighten us about these issues. And uh, the last questions from uh, Pak Giri. Thank you for your uh, hard questions, actually. <laughs> yes, uh, for the transboundary issues, uh, actually these issues, I uh, discussed it uh, on last three or four years together with Bureni and Pak Anom together. Uh, this is quite, it's quite uh, I don't know, very hot topics by that time. Well, because so many states, uh, there are, I don't know, uh, kind of uh, give the support to us, but some of the states uh, is not giving their full supports to, 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 to build the new uh, contention about this uh, transboundary issues. Uh, that's why uh, we made to an agreement, we agree on to develop the regional uh, corporations and bilaterals as a model law to be developed by each state, rather than enforcing the conventions that actually needed by the states. Uh, but based on the urgency itself, uh, I think. Uh, the, the, the first step to have those uh, regional or bilateral corporations uh, would be sufficient by this time. But uh, we are thinking that probably in the future we can explore the possibility to have a more a broader uh, participation through the interconventions related with these issues. So, uh, and right now, I think uh, some countries, uh, I don't know whether they are ready to uh, have those conventions, but uh, I think this uh, measures right now will be sufficient for now, but uh, we can explore the possibility to have those conventions in the future. Thank you. Phew. More, more. <laughs> <laughs> All of the questions as with answer for the session first, session one. <laughs> okay, uh, audience, uh, we have Tofa. Hi, Tenofa, welcome. Uh, she also <laughs> from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, uh, she always come also for the uh, sharing sessions. Okay, um, is there any other questions from the students um, regarding the presentations of Kang Adit, the safety of navigations and uh, marine environment issues? No? I think there, for for my side, I think this, there there are so many questions can I did because there are so many cases. But and I want to, my in my mind was like, oh my god, your work is hard because you deal with so many things. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, the one that I presented is only uh ten percent of those issues, wow. all of those issues. So many things because we handle also the private uh law side of it as well. So. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't mentioned also about the national law regarding the, the related topics. I think it's yeah. also more complex, isn't it? Like, yeah. Um, if, if you <laughs> so actually many. want to have a question about the maritime law, Bureni over here is my yeah. teacher. Is my lectures about the maritime law. So, so she wrote a book about those maritime law. See, I fully understand about whole issues related to maritime law. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, it's cool. Oh, my God. Um, so that's why now. now uh, yes, I, 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 I learned a lot from you. No, 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 no. In opposite, I learned from you. <laughs> it's very, very nice to have you, uh, Terani. Uh, 
so we have uh, like a uh, um, more uh, um, uh, inside. <laughs> I did. I will talk about this. Uh, I think there are so many issues related to these matters, um, and I do understand that uh, there are so many problems within the uh, even within these two areas on the law of the sea. But we have so many uh, things in the law of the sea, and that's why I th the reason of why our students uh always proposed or uh, the topics of the law of the sea so it's about like this say like 90 percent of the students propose a uh, topic on the law of the sea but unfortunately the lectures are <laughs> collapsed because <laughs> we have uh, uh and um uh, very limited resources so we uh, unfortunately we have to stop the uh, th uh, uh, uh final um passes on regards to, in regards to the law of the sea because we have no resources unfortunately but i do understand uh, it, it doesn't mean that we have to close the, our research um uh, i think there are a lot of uh, good things that we can also share also trick the questions to to the to the, to the students for the final exam <laughs> mm -hmm. and I did. Um, I think I my questions are very basic. Maybe you're, I think you're freezing. Maybe Go very ahead. basic because not all of the things are questions, but comments. Oh, freezing. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, Brian, is that hello? Yeah. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. Okay, I, I I apologize to all of you because I don't know why today I think the connection is very bad. Uh, I always found and um, uh, disconnect or freeze. I thought it would happen yesterday because we talked about Palestine. So I think someone will hack <laughs> us talking about the Palestine, but it was good. Yeah, but today I don't know. I'm I I am sorry for 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 these technical matters. Um, I'm 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 back to 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 Kang Adit. Kang Adit, uh, I found so many so many uh, very interesting issues to be discussed with the students, and also probably with you um, from the um, so, so many instruments that you mentioned. Matters. Um, I cannot say it one by one, but there are so many of it. And uh, for example. Delvin, are you still there? <laughs> uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, um, about the collisions of the cruise. Oh my God! Oh, it's Ben. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I will try to uh, yeah. fix this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, is it is that okay now? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, maybe I, I was just like turn off my camera first. Okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's something wrong. Okay. Uh, can I did? Uh, I'd like to uh ask you about the uh how's the progress, how's the update of the uh issues that Mbak Diaz uh mentioned about the 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 cruise uh, the the cruise boat uh which was um uh the case of the where the cruise boat uh, um, uh, what was that like in raja ampat uh, incidents the cruise was the was the uh, private company right so how 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 is the update how's the half indonesia and this uh, uh, um, respond this is that any uh, st then finally goes to the state of uh, state responsibility or is it the, to the corporate responsibility to 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 repair all of the damages commit uh, happens in the raja ampat in uh, sea uh, thank you, Bu Ori, for the questions. Um, I'm not really up to date uh, with these issues, but uh, by the with the information that I received uh, regarding this uh, case, actually this case is, was brought into the uh, private uh, corporations, uh, something like that, and private law. So we sue them. Uh, something like that, and it, they, it has to do with the insurance or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't see any possibility of having a state's obligation on that in these matters because it's considered as the uh, violation or the negligence of the uh, ships itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, the in this case, the Ministry of Environment is actually the one become the focal point 
to to to, to dealing with this issue. So there are suing the private company. Uh, I I'm not sure what 300 million or something like that, based on this uh, the the evidence that they have received, something like that. But uh, I'm not uh, fully informed with this kind of this issues uh, because uh, the the, the uh, trial itself is related with the environment issue. So and then also was brought into the Ministry of Environmental uh, under the Ministry of Environmental Focal Point something like that. Okay. Uh, but in, I don't know. Probably Ambassador Anom or Ambassador Remy know this information better than me. I think Anom has left because he has something to do. Um, oh really? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. He suddenly uh, <laughs> he says he he'd like to uh, leave the room. But any maybe you have something uh, to share about that uh, case? I, I'm sorry. I'm not really well aware with okay. the, uh, the development <laughs> since I'm not handling the issue anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, that's okay. No problem. Uh, um, I, I do remember this. This is like some years ago, and uh -huh. this case also was brought to the class. So I, they, I asked uh, to the dispute settlement class. I asked them how will they settle the this this dispute? Will they ask the state responsibility or what? So, just uh, I just kind of kind of a refreshing. <laughs> But that's okay. But I do. I also re, uh, interesting to the issues of the explorations and exploitations uh, in on the offshore. Um, you, Kang Adit uh, has mentioned uh, some instruments in regards to that. There's a there's an instrument that um, regulate what uh, should be done if you know the, there's a uh, the the impact of these explorations has damaging the environment of the sea. But Kang Adit, in fact. Uh, um, we would. I, I'd like to know. We'd like to know how how is it actually work? How, how works? Uh, how is it the implementation actually? Because uh, even though, uh, for example, there's this cooperation between Nigeria and I forget another state. So let's say a, a state and a state. So there's there is cooperation between two states to do the exploration within the sea. But then uh, the, the the technical matters is given to the third party, which is a a, a private company. And this private company made a mistake, so he damaging the uh, environment. Who shall be responsible then by the conventions? Is that uh, if the state, if I think it is very obvious, it's International Wrongful Act because it violates the, the treaty. But this corporate, uh, this private company, he's not the party to the, to the, to the treaty. So how, 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 how is it in the practice? Is it go back to the state who, uh, give the work to this private company, or is it the private company who shall, who shall be responsible for all the damages on the sea? Uh, thank you, uh, Buorin. So uh, let me uh, in, uh, state, let me check again. Okay. Uh, regarding of this uh, uh, damage from the offshore facilities, uh, we would like to inform you that actually there are no uh, international conventions that regulating these issues yet. This is the number one uh, issue that need to be addressed. So uh, the one that we promote the Indonesian government in this case in the IMO, uh, we would like to give the model law to be uh, used for the bilateral or regional corporations. The, 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 the content of it, we uh, take the principles from others, uh, from the others conventions, but not really related with these offshore activities. It's related with these uh, CLC uh, convention, in case you know that uh, conventions and a fund convention or something like that. So uh, it has several principles. The first one to be, it has the strict liability, something like that, and channeling liability. Uh, and then uh, evidence of, insurance or other financial security, direct actions against the insurer, something like that. So uh, I think the most important is we promote that one country has the corporation or regional corporation related with this issue first, then uh, we can have uh, further technical issues, uh, technical details related to it. Uh, in principles, uh, politer-based principles will be the best principles. So 
the uh, private company should be responsible for it. So in this case, in the Montara, I think the Montara is responsible to give the compensations, not the states, but the private companies. So yes, I think that, that the principles that taken from the others uh, convention, for example, the CLC and fund convention can be used. And uh, we are promoting to have a regional and uh, bilateral corporations. And I think the polluter pays principles would be the best answer for this. So okay, because I, I so I uh, I think I misunderstood. I skip. I thought there was okay, this already, but actually it's a proposal. But it's a proposal because that that is actually what is happening. Yeah. yeah. But have you considered also that the IMO have considered about these issues about the third party's responsibility? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, so, so it's under uh, our proposal actually when we uh, propose the model of international conventions that related to it we took the example of the other con uh, conventions that related yeah. to it and we already took it to, into consideration about this one but again uh, we didn't have the su enough support from the member yes. states so it would become uh, the model law for regional and the bilateral agreement yeah i think it's interesting uh, uh, yeah to be to be to be uh, proposed and yeah we wish that this can be uh, come true <laughs> the, the thing is in uh, all of the un agency or, or international organization or in this case the international maritime organization uh, there are several strong private company behind the state itself yes so uh, they speak on behalf of the private company, for instance, the US, United States, the, uh, the Latino countries, they have a strong, uh, what is it, a stance on this case. They refuse to have a dedicated international convention for it. Uh, but I think Bureni, could you enlighten us because he's the one who, she's the one who draft all this model law actually wow cool. <laughs> please if you don't mind <laughs> actually not the model but actually in back in 2012 when we first uh proposed the uh transboundary oil pollution um resulting from uh oil spill active uh, sorry oil oil rigs activities um i forgot the, the name and we were actually uh aiming for a new international regime uh, conventions. However, uh, there are still many uh, countries that is against the concept because actually they are like what I did said before that uh, the IMO was actually quite uh, separate in their, their opinions, whether they are, uh, whether the issue could be discussed in the IMO uh, since it, uh, it is not, uh, since the oil rig is not considered as a ship. And then also that uh, whether uh, how far is the uh, how far is the IMO could uh, deal with that and uh, as as what Wadi said that there are actually several uh, conventions that has been dealing with that especially one of it is uh, oil preparedness uh, uh, convention. However, um, it was it was uh, rolling in the in in the table for about. So, uh, several years, and then um, after I re uh, I returned back to Jakarta in 2016, I heard that it was actually uh, becoming. I thought that at first, I thought that they will absolutely against that, so that there will not be any legal. Uh, uh, there will be any legal instrument on that, but. Actually, we managed. Actually, the IMO managed to make it as a guideline, which I say that that is a um, that is one of the a very good outcome that we can achieve uh, in considering the uh, considering the uh, uh, considering the 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 the, the, the numbers of countries that against us in in the deliberation of the issues. So I was quite surprised, and I was also happy. At least uh, Indonesia has managed to put into something uh, as a reference for the next international uh, in international maritime law, or at least uh, 
maybe of what the for for international law of the sea and uh, if i may add more one convention project that we talk about clc you can also talk about the bunker conventions actually that imo has so many convention that is uh, that are dealing with ships and one of the uh, convention that uh, dealing with the marine environmental convention is the bunker convention above which is uh, dealing with the issue of the uh, pollution caused by the oil from the uh, as a, as a, how to say bahan uh, bakar of the of the ship it's a poor feeling so maybe that's uh, uh, my addition thank you very much <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Te, um, yeah. Reni or Tehreni, for your very enlightened information. Uh, can I did, uh, yes, can, can want I to add, add something? Some more? Yeah. yeah. So uh, before the discussion about this new regime comes in, uh, on the 2010, if not mistaken, there are questions actually. Uh, does IMO has mandate and jurisdiction to develop the new international regime on liability and compensation for oil damage mm -hmm. uh, resulting from those uh, explorations? And I remember by the time uh, on one of the legal committee of IMO, the, uh, the Secretary of General of uh, IMO stated that, uh, that the they have the competence in dealing with these issues. But again, it's not really matters of this uh, Secretary General's point of view, but it's decision of the states during the discussion of the IMO. Uh, during the, the, the discussion of the IMO, we have a strong uh, support from the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Denmark, and others. But again, the other states does not agree with this. While the IMO, we need to have consensus with related with this kind of a new regime. So that's why I agree with Bureni that I'm quite happy uh, with the presence of the new uh, model or the new what is it? Uh, guidance on bilateral or regional agreements, agreements on those arrangements. And again, probably in the near future, when Bureni become uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs or probably the Director General of uh, a law of the treaty or something like that, uh, she could submit another proposal of the new regime of international convention or something like that. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I think my head is Lieu. You know Lieu? <laughs> 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 So many instruments that, you, that we have to work on that you uh, that you all the governments really work on some of them. Oh, yeah, with the really hard work to establish to, to, with the objective to make all of the things are work in a good way. Wow, cool. Uh, can I, did, I want to go back to the maritime labor conventions. May oh, I? Okay. <laughs> uh, we know, I think last year we have also some very uh, uh, um, a uh, viral case about the, our seafarer who were now suddenly I forget the English pelarungan uh, the seafarers because uh, at the first time of the pandemic, uh, I, which I do believe that has already been uh, uh, regulated and all uh, um, uh, by the by the by these conventions. And this, as you already also explained, that these conventions also talking about the safety of the of the seafarer, uh, the basic rights of the seafarer. What I knew that this what happened to. Uh, uh, to this, this seafarer, if they work probably for the boat crews with, for the uh, uh, exclu uh, uh, what is that? Uh, now I said didn't forget the word. Um, kapal mewa, kapal kapal pesiar. Probably they they were they are they are in quite in good hand. They are quite good. But the problems arise if they work as a seafarer in the large uh, vessels, right? I some some months ago, I I, I heard the uh, testimony of a of a former seafarer who said that he 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 wasn't allowed to eat uh, three times a day. He was only allowed uh, um, eat once a day, or very very limited access to drink. He, he it's very difficult for him to practice his religion to pray because he's a Muslim. I mean, like. like so many issues in regards to that, and it all. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I, my, my, my information maybe is not valid, because, but what I know, the little thing that I know, it's always happened in the, uh, you know, it's like a fisheries boat or a fisheries vessels or the uh, 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 about large vessels, and 
we also found that these uh, uh, those ships also committed uh, many other crimes such as illegal fishing so in, within the ship used uh, uh, fake flags because they use uh, uh, not the true not the real registered flag of the of the of the ship and they do also uh, um, uh, trafficking and even slavery within the ships that's kind of common situation isn't it or can can you give some comments on this Thank you, Robin. Uh, actually, the Maritime Library Convention is one of the conventions that I had interest with. Uh, you're correct that so many issues related with the seafarers, uh, the abandonment, and then uh, you say that pelarungan. I kind of forget what is the English. Burini, what's the English? Yes, of I said you forget. <laughs> I remember. I'm curious. Is there anyone remember? I what was it? <laughs> I try to find it. What the right uh, right words for it? But again, uh, the key for this issues is related with the uh, as how effective we implementing the maritime library conventions. Uh, this that's why the maritime library convention are present is present because uh, the, the 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 maritime library convention also regulate about the the, the, the working conditions of the seafarers, the, the recreational facilities, food, accommodation, catering, mm -hmm. and others, health protections, well care, medical care, social security protection, all of it within even the wage, mm -hmm. they are regulated on this uh, Marcham Lambert conventions. So, what the important is to ensure that how flag states could implement this maritime library convention effectively mm -hmm. the control is very important while also for the foreign ships we can have the port states control to ensure that all of those requirements on the maritime library convention is already complied with those vessels so the the, the key will be how the flag states control their ships this is uh, that's why i mentioned about the ship registry registry the joint link between the flag states and the ships uh, when we already have the control, we already comply with all of the regulations under the MLC. I think all of those uh, problems that you mentioned uh, is, is not there. I mean, it will be, uh, it's already answers. I mean, all of those uh, working environments problem and something like that is not new. It's some things that we can see every day in Indonesia as well. But the thing is, not all of the ships in Indonesia is comply with the Maritime Library Convention. We just ratified those Maritime Library Convention in 2017 or 2018, I think. Uh, enlightened me, Bureni. I think just recently, right? Yeah, it's under the, uh, I think it's 2017 or 2018, something like that. It's just very recent we uh, ratified those uh, Maritime Library Conventions. But at least uh, those, um, uh, what is it, uh, the certifications, uh, the, the, the supervisions, the monitoring is getting better based on those uh, conventions. Yeah, In 2016, if I can. It's in 2016. Oh, 2016, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I have one last question, but then I think I uh, Kangeri always said that he would like to ask some other questions. My last question is regards to the traditional ship, uh, traditional boat, which usually used by the traditional fishermen, uh, the little that little ship, which usually takes a lot of people, the illegal migrants, and of course they really don't care about the safety which i do not quite sure also whether the what do you call it the the driver of the of the ship of the boat <laughs> whether the, he has the master master of the boat the whether he has a license or not I th we have so many cases here in indonesia because uh, is a indonesia is a very place for, to transit before they go <laughs> to the australia yeah and there are so many cases i do remember uh, okay maybe all of us will remember the tampa case it was uh, the tampa tried to save this immigrant who would like to 
to go to the Christmas Island because the conditions of the ship and also the conditions of the people. And when I asked also the um, uh, uh, officers from the uh, Indonesian Navy SEAL, they say that they would they what they, what they usually do is uh, helping them because of the humanitarian uh, uh, um, uh, ground. And it's also said in the UNCLOS if you found some say, someone or some people in, in the distress, you must you should help. But that, how, how would this actually the the policy of the Ministry of the um, Transportation in regards to this issue? With this is I think your area, Kang uh, Adit. Thank you, uh, Bu Orin. I think it does is that's not necessarily our own issues right now yes. regarding these issues because uh, I remember when we are dealing with these issues, uh, we have cooperation as well with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with uh, the fisheries agency or something like that. So it, it does not only concern with our uh, task or something like that. But uh, by the way, we see it, it's related with the ship safety first. Uh, the non-convention, we say that as a non-convention because when we say the, the convention vessel, the solace vessel, all of the equipments, all of the certifications, all of the life-saving appliances is already there. Uh, the substandard vessels, this uh, non convention vessel, does not equip with the life saving appliance and others. And uh, it's very hard for us to control of this kind of vessels, especially when this vessel was built and operate and registered in other states. In this case, when uh, you're saying about the refugees, uh, they are traditional vessels that being used to navigate to the other the, uh, waters, to go to another uh, countries to have a better life probably. Uh, the, from the uh, safety perspective, of course, we cannot ex accept these conditions. The, but the thing is, it happens even in our flags of registry. So many uh, traditional shops, that's not, it's not registered yet, the, 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 the national, uh, the, the uh, residential shops. So uh, what we're trying to do is right now, we're trying to make them to register their vessels, to educate them, the, the, the seafarer, how to uh, to be a better seafarer, something like that, uh, to have better understand, understanding on the safety side of it. And uh, about the refugees itself, uh, of course, in the humanitarian aspects, we need to help them. Uh, of course, about, uh, but in terms of safety, if those ships come into our ports, we will detain them. We will say that this vessel cannot uh, sail another country uh, ports because uh, based on the solace, uh, when uh, ships, uh, when foreign grand, uh, foreign grand ships uh, navigate to another uh, country, they need to have those certificates based on solace. Uh, that's why this uh, traditional ships, they are illegal ships, they're non -traditional, uh, they are traditional ships, that it's hard for us to control them. But I think in uh, humanitarian aspects, we need to have obligation to help them. You're correct. But uh, our policy, we are helping them, but uh, I'm not sure whether uh, we can prevent them because they're coming from other states. Yes, <laughs> it's a trans-organized crime. That's yeah. Quite difficult to, yeah. What, what can we do is just like yes. Basically, we have to educate them because what happened, what we see on the, in field. Getting also part of my team working with yeah. this, even the officers, they know, but just oh yes, I heard, but not really know about this. Uh, the fishermen, the the the, the, the societies, yeah, they not quite understand. I think, yes, it's very important for us to educate the people. Okay, yeah. I think, uh, can we just go to Gary to the to, to next questions? Maybe yeah. last question regarding the matter, the substantial matters. Yeah, th thank you very much for another opportunity to ask question. Um, Kang, um, since uh, you, have, um, you have made a point about um, law enforcement relating to transnational or trans-organized crime, I want to go back to environmental law issue. Um, 
And this is, I think, I believe there is a relation between environmental protection, especially in marine environment, to law enforcement and law supervision. supervision. And according to uh, that point, um, can you elaborate more about what, uh, about how United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea and also IMO Convention giving um, give um, coastal state port state, um, also flag state jurisdiction to, let's say, uh, enforcing, uh, uh, make a law, make their law enforcement forces uh, prevent or criminalize uh, the, the doer of uh, marine pollution. Thank you, Kang. Uh, thank you, uh, Kang Yeri, for your uh, very comprehensive questions about these issues. So uh, the, the, the most important one about the marine environmental protection based on the clause, that uh, the UNCLOS clearly stated that we need to uh, prevent and we need to uh, promote the, 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 the marine environmental protection and we need to cooperate with other states in terms of the uh, marine environmental protection. That's the first key. And then how we uh, enforce that with so many uh, with so many legal instruments of label and IMO, uh, and in particular like Marple, something like that. The, the, the important part of it is the roles of the flag states and the port states to control all the vessels. The flag states to ensure that all of the vessels uh, on our registry, for instance, Indonesian uh, flag states, we need to be uh, ready to uh, supervise them. We need to do uh, supervisions, to do inspection, to ensure that they already comply with all the regulations made by the IMO, the certification itself. Because uh, when the ships coming to the ports before they are leaving, they need to have certain permit. Before we give them those permit, they need to be uh, they need to uh, uh, fulfill all the requirements. The the other the, the other uh, requirements uh, will be the environmental conditions of the ships. So uh, the marine uh, inspector, the marine surveyor, will check whether the ships already comply with the vessels. That's the flag states, and then comes into the port states. When the come when the ships foreign ships come to our uh, ports. Based on those certification, we'll check the port state control officer will check whether all of those aspects uh, already comply. Or does the the one that being uh, certified by the ships uh, by the flag states is present? Is there? I mean, it's available. That's the all the machinery related with the marine environmental protection related with the uh, ballast water or something like that is already in place that the duty of the port state control officers. So I would like to reiterate that the UNCLOS stated that the uh, states should prevent uh, the marine environmental protection uh, jointly or individually. Jointly, we need to, uh, to have cooperation with other states. It will be better, but we need to have uh, the efforts to prevent those environmental uh, uh, pollution or something like that. So those would be my answer. Yeah, one following up question, if yeah. I may want it just a bit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah talking about marine um, pollution, especially marine debris, we have to define, we can divide it or, or marine debris or marine pollution from ships and also from uh, uh, land or we call it land-based pollution. And for this, I believe we have uh, ratified Basel Convention, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the question is how 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 uh, how uh, Indonesia uh, incorporate this you, you know like connected uh, the the enforcement the supervision and also the regulation between land based and also marine based pollution. Oh, okay, uh, that is hard questions. I mean, uh, usually I'm working from the ship side of the uh, environmental impact from the ship side i mean i'm not uh, fully aware about the convention that you mentioned about uh, about the land based uh, what is it uh, pollution or something like that but 
uh, again, I think the provision of the film clause is quite clear. When uh, the film clause requires all states to protect and preserve the marine environment, regardless of its conventions itself, the, uh, whether the IMO and others conventions, uh, I know they have their technical, uh, what is it, uh, regulation about the, the certain issues. However, the provisions of the uh, UNCLOS is quite clear that we need to re require to protect and preserve the marine environment. And uh, the, the, the initiatives that comes for us, whether we need we want to have our clean oceans, whether we would like to have a better life in the future for our children. That's the, the, the question. So regardless of the conventions, I think that's the key principles is how we can put the environmental issues into the priority. So uh, the, we can put into considerations for uh, the society, the importance of keeping all the garbage away from the sea. So we don't want to see that the uh, Kuta beach surrounded by the garbage. Then they, they are accusing that it comes from the ships, that it actually comes from the land base. So again, well, I think the initiatives that need comes, uh, should comes from us first to ensure that their ocean is clean and can be uh, used for our future generations. Wow, my answers. <laughs> well, it's very very interesting discussion. I think we have still a lot of things to discuss, but it's one thirty already. Oh, oh really? my god! Yes. Uh, really? wow. Yes, it's one thirty. We're running out of time. I think we need to have some more other special uh, 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 sessions on the particular issues. Yeah, Kang Adit, Kang Eri, Tereni. Maybe we will invite Kang Re uh, Kang Reni. Sorry, <laughs> Tereni and also Badias. Also, yeah. we'll think about it. Uh, let's see the schedule because we are very busy. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I, did, I think I need to uh, 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 I, uh, one, one, one sentence to conclude that how to, uh, the, it is the state control how to see the, how the implementation of those international regulations, yeah, um, including into what happened in the field. Can I did, because this is certain sessions, I, I need your closing remark as to motivate the students here to be like you or you are very uh, inspired. <laughs> you're, you're, kind of such inspirations for all the students with all with your presentations and all your achievement. Please, Kang, I did. Uh, thank you, Bu uh, Orin, for your, uh, uh, what is it, uh, statement. Uh, again, uh, I would like to invite all of the students over here to explore uh, uh, the maritime law. The maritime law is not only related with the law of the sea. So many uh, things over there. You need to burden uh, your knowledge itself, then you know what areas that you had interest with, you have interest with. For instance, uh, probably you, uh, if you have interest with the public uh, maritime law, then you find that marine insurance is suitable for you, something like that. So the thing is, uh, don't focus only on law of the sea itself. So many conventions out there, so many problems, so many issues out there. You need to develop or yourself, take the issues, take the statistics, statistical numbers or something like that to be your guidance or something like that. Discuss it uh, and uh, with us probably, I open my door for you. I will give my email and Buorin could give your, I'll give my number to all of the students if necessary. So if you want to have a further discussions about the um, marine environmental issues, the safety of navigations, please come to us. And I think Bureni uh, is a, an expert as well. If you are aware, she's also wrote a book related to the maritime law. Wow. Yeah, so, so many things. So, and, and I would like to encourage all of you to work on other ministry aside of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> yes, yes. So, <laughs> in fact. You. In fact, well, I did also working with the international law uh, related issues somehow, yeah. Somehow, because uh, because there are uh, some time as I don't know, uh, some say that the international issues can only be discussed on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but in fact, in our technical ministries, we are dealing with these kind of issues as, as well. So we need your 
I don't know, uh, assistants to join yes. us. <laughs> come on, please, please come. Yes. And then uh, I would like to encourage you to join. Uh, there are two institutions under the International Maritime Organizations. The first one, the International Maritime Law Institutes, is where uh, Ibu Reni graduated for, from. Uh, it's, it's a very good uh, maritime institute related with the maritime law. And the other one, the World Maritime University, and they provide also the maritime law and policy program. So I uh, encourage you to join those two uh, institutions because if you are have interest with the maritime law and policy and love the sea because they're providing us uh, very good resources to help you to grow, to further your knowledge. I think wow. that's it for me. <laughs> cool. And there's also scholarship for, uh, scholarship for that, yeah? Kang yeah. Adit? Bugeni will help with that. <laughs> I think we will have next session on the scholarships on how to get to maritime <laughs> institutes. If you know more about the uh, International Maritime Law Institute, you can contact me and uh, uh, they, they provide the scholarship as well. Like what the uh, World Maritime University where uh, I did uh, get his uh, graduates. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Adu is You are very, uh, very generous for this. Thank you very much. So maybe I will. I, I need to need your. Uh, I need to have your contact as well, if you don't mind. So maybe we have another, because Madias from S also would like uh, requesting for another <laughs> session in regards to these issues. Inshallah, uh, next uh, next time we will talk. We have another talk to uh, more specific issues. Thank you very much again uh, uh, for our appreciation, Kang Adit. We have uh, a certificate. Uh, uh, oh. e certificate. Please <laughs> kindly accept this for our gratitude for your uh, you. time and knowledge and sharing everything. Uh, God you. will pay you this. Oh, <laughs> you. Can, we, can we take a picture, all of us? Yeah, sure. And we, we will have a, um, a photo session. Uh, please turn on your camera, uh, all of the participants. This is our last, uh, I, I I promise this is our last time, our last <laughs> session, <laughs> our last minute. Please turn on your camera, so and Rere will take the uh, comments on this. Rere, please. Thank you, Borin. Ladies and gentlemen, please activate your cameras. We are going to have a photo session together in three, two, and one. All right, one more time. Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rere. Thank you again uh, for Kang Adi, Tehreni, all of the participants and Thank all you. of the students. I hope you, uh, Kang Giri, I hope you all get the more uh, enlightenment in regards to this. I hope you get more curious, and please do not give, uh, do not uh, feel frustrated. Oh, there are a lot of issues I want to, uh, I want to investigate with, with for my thesis, but the department said, you know, to more international. Don't worry, be happy. We still have final exam. So if you have one, if you have some idea, we have journals. Kang Adi, Tehreni, uh, we welcome you, but. The Yes, to write in our journal, Pajajaran Jural of International Law. If some, uh, if you have something to share with us, please uh, drop us uh, your articles uh, and please visit our website, PJEL. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, uh, oh, sorry. Um, Please uh, join us again tomorrow, not tomorrow, uh, the day after tomorrow, which is Thursday at 2 p.m. We will discuss about Myanmar coup d'etat from the perspective of the ASEAN, Indonesian government, and also the academics, uh, academicians. We will have Mbak Yuyun from ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. We will have Pak Abdul Qadir Jailani from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Professor Keith Flinterman from the Utrah and Maastricht University. So please. Join us again on the same link, and uh, if you don't have, uh, if you cannot uh, um, attend, I'm um, sorry, if you don't have any space to come because uh, um, uh, we're afraid that it will be full host like yesterday. So you can also visit our our YouTube channel. You can also, for those who just uh, join this uh, sessions uh, in the middle, you can also rewind the, our sessions, our discussion from our YouTube channel. Thank you very much again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang. Selamat siang. Bye-bye.